Hello all and welcome. If you are new here, I am a stay-at-home wife and mother of three. I have a three-year-old, a one-year-old, and one due in September. We are members of a small reformed Presbyterian church here in our town, a congregation of about 40 people, and the entirety of our service is spent with our children. Our service runs about two hours and can be kind of separated into like four different parts. The first part would be standing, sitting, singing, and the congregational participation. The second part being the sermon, which we sit for. The third part being communion, which we stand up and go up for. And then the last part being the commission and a couple songs that we sing before entering into a fellowship meal that we do weekly. Now our approach with our children um, and church change with every stage of life, sometimes even weekly, but no matter what age they are or what attitude they are, how we're approaching them, our attitude is always with the goal in mind for our kids to be part of the service, to be part of it with us, and for them to understand to their best ability what's going on. And our goal is to eventually have them sitting in service with us and participating. So every week when we go in there, that is what our goal is, is for them to understand what's going on. So a lot of the time we are talking through things with them and experiencing the service with them. Which brings me to the list of toys that I have accumulated. Now, prior to having kids, I was a nanny for 10 years and had already accumulated quite a long list of these toys that are great for busy situations. Um, whether you are taking your kids to an event, a wedding, or um, maybe a sporting event of their siblings or something that requires them to hold still for a long period of time. Um, these toys are great for those purposes as well. But the key that's always been important for us is that these toys are specific for Sundays so that they aren't a common toy and don't end up becoming something that has lost its luster over time. So we do keep all of the toys that are current in current rotation in a bag that we actually keep at our church. So without further ado, starting off with our Little Littles uh, toys, we have Chewy Teethers. Um, there are obviously thousands of them out there. Uh, we keep specific ones in our bags for Sundays, just as we do with the older kids' toys. Um, these usually have more dramatic bobs and doodads on them and are something interesting to look at as well as chew on. Um, we also keep um, what a lot of people refer to as sensory toys with us for the little littles that are really just fidget toys that they can chew on and play with and interact with. These come in multiple different forms, but there are a lot of them out there that are great use it, that are great used for this and also can apply to the older kids that don't make a lot of noise as well. Some of these toys are like quiet poppets or um, liquid fidget toys. A lot of these I remember from my childhood, things with squishy buttons or water that swirls around we also like to have um, baby books on hand that don't have crinkle pages, but have some sort of interactive parts to them, like um, rubber feelers or fuzzy things. Um, some of our favorites are where it's like each character has different textures to them and they allow the kids to interact with them. We'll find books that have like mirrors in them. We obviously just stay away from any that make noise. Also keep in mind that with our little littles, we do usually have a nap during service. So this allows us to budget some of our time and gives us more of a grace period with them as well. Um, once we graduate that infant just becoming toddler stage, um, that's when we start to make sure that we hone in on our toys being something that encourages our kids to sit down with us and do, but we're not completely strict on that. One of the toys we gravitate towards during this graduation age is a backpack that has laces and buckles on it. Um, we also have a little like square, um, I guess it would be considered plushy that also has a zipper on top and it has buckles on it. Um, a lot of things that are just more um, tactile play uh, that they can play with 
these we've worn down to the point where they don't really make a whole lot of noise so it's never really a problem during service but that might be something to keep in mind when you're buying one brand new we also have this bean bag that um, we actually got from a craft show but i've seen these in multiple different places online as well where it's just a bean bag that has a little picture window in it and it's a search and find so there's like beads that are in shapes of specific things and the kids can look at the tag and look for specific ones or what we usually do is um, we'll just name off things for them to look for. We also have these drawing pads that are in our constant rotation. I got this as a recommendation from another YouTuber a few years ago and have been so grateful for this ever since. They are super cheap and actually quite impressive little tools. Um, they're just a drawing pad that has a rainbow background. So when you draw into it, it leaves a rainbow footprint. We always have this one in rotation. Um, it has been helpful for multiple different age groups. We also um, have quite a few water wow books that we have purchased in the past. We look specifically for the ones that have like hidden images within the pictures so that it not only entertains our little littles but it also is interesting for our older ones to kind of search and find for those then as we start to get up a little bit further into more of the child age group one of our favorite activities is a busy book um, this has actually been quite a successful toy overall for multiple different ages um, there are tons of these busy books online um, i actually used to make these for my work kids back when it wasn't really a thing that you could buy. So it got, it was really exciting for me when I found out that you could actually buy these. Um, they come just in a plain book and then you get all the like card stock um, p puzzle pieces, basically matching pieces. And you have to put the, the Velcro pieces on it um, the way that you want them. And then it comes with markers. We kind of started off where we didn't include the markers and didn't use those at all. And then just would do the first couple pages of this specific book had like matching the colors or matching the letters. The flip side of all the Velcro pages are drawing interactive activities. So tracing and mazes and um, some pages are just blank, so we kind of use them as a whiteboard and we'll draw things on there too, or have him draw things on there. Um, and this keeps us pretty steadily busy. Now this seems kind of obvious, but, um, we like to keep cheap coloring books on hand as well. I try to find these at like dollar general type of situations, but I find the ones that have specifically the little picture window with the crayons in it so that the kids can like pop them in and out of place. So I think currently we have a Minnie Mouse one for my daughter and a Spider-Man one for my son. My kids haven't even really watched either of those, but they just enjoy the coloring. I know it sounds really funny, but the next thing is just plain notebooks for the kids. Um, there have been multiple times where just drawing things in there and having something for them to look back on is really helpful and um, also allowing our son to practice his letters or to doodle or whatever and then we'll just you know specify what kind of tools to use whether it's pencil pen or crayons or color pencils but even something like that is super helpful and kind of gives them the ability to feel a little bit more freedom some honorary mentions would be um Search and find books or I spy books. Um, they make these in all different graduated sizes. We have ones that are for like toddlers that are super easy. And then they've got like the early reader ones. And then of course the big I spy books. Uh, fidget toys, I kind of already mentioned, but that is something that we've talked about having a few of just in case the other things aren't really helping. Um, there are some really great ones out there that don't make noise. And we also have been looking into these blocks called plus plus blocks. This kind of is like fidget meets Lego, but they're, they're a softer plastic. So they wouldn't make like a ton of noise if they were to fall on the floor. Um, we're thinking about doing this as a birthday present here in a couple months to try it out and see how it goes. But we did try them out at a store recently and they seem really promising and also play off the creative imagination a lot. So that might be something to look into. Um, reusable sticker books or magnet books. 
we've had a few of these. We had one that was like a farm and it, there were little magnets that they could put the animals where they belong in the picture. Um, we had one from the Cars movie, I think at one point was a, a Christmas present. Um, They've gotten out of rotation mainly because we moved, but they were kind of a fun, helpful thing for a little while. Definitely a quicker burnout in our household, but you, you never know what might work for your kids. We also have a love-hate relationship with Play-Doh. I don't really know if I should put this on honorable mentions or dishonorable mentions for us. Um, it has been a steady, like, one that's come in and out of play. Um, it's currently out of play because it's just too much of a... Uh, frustration between our kids and it might change over time but as of right now it was just getting on the chairs in the church and on the floor and um, kind of caused some heated moments um, here and there so we just chose to keep it out of play but what we did do when we had it in play was we had a small little tray that they both could play in that was shallow it would keep the Play-Doh in. We would only do the small container of Play-Dohs and just split it half and half and then had little cookie cutters, but just a few items for it. And that was as much as we did. And we didn't play with Play-Doh the rest of the week. Some dishonorable mentions, <laughs> things at least that didn't work for us. So again, Play-Doh, put that where you will. Um, small piece toys like Legos and blocks. We bought this puzzle off of Amazon, which in general is a great toy, but not great for church after all. Um, had wooden little block pieces and shapes that they would give you cards and you tried to draw, make, the, make the design that they showed in the picture. And it worked for like two weeks, but then they just kept falling on the floor and it was messy and it was bulky to keep at the church. So we just have stopped using that one. Some more dishonorable mentions would be um, puzzles. We love puzzles in our household, but unfortunately they just get too messy. They get scattered. You end up losing pieces. Anything that's sticky like slime or Play-Doh or things like that, we keep away from the situation. We also keep things away that leave some sort of residue like markers or pens or things of that nature. We didn't do very well with lacing toys. We had quite a few different lacing toys that they could play with and they honestly just burnt out of those really fast. I think some kids really like them and other kids don't and ours just haven't really gravitated towards those at this point. They kind of do it really fast and then they just are done. Now, although I've mentioned a lot of items so far, I do want to say that we have all of these items ready to go if we want to put them in rotation. But when I say rotation, like in a normal given week, we only have maybe two activities that we actually pull out during service. Um, we try really hard to have our kids involved in the service. So usually what that looks like is the first part of service when we're standing and sitting and reading the word, um, we will hold them or have them interact with us and recite back the, the call and responses that they know and have them very involved. And then, um, we usually will have some sort of snack or even their lunch with us, which is usually a sandwich, and let them eat during this time when they're getting up and getting down so that they have something to actively do and keep them busy in between their interactions. And then um, during the sermon is when we will actually give them something physically active to do. And then we will transition into communion, which they participate in. And then after the sermon, they usually participate in the rest of it. If you are in the early stages of implementing this kind of system with your kids and you're looking for some advice, I'd love to offer a few things um, that would have really helped us if we would have heard them when we first started um, doing this with our kids. You can take it or leave it, obviously, but I just wanted to mention a few things out there that have been really helpful to us through this process. First and foremost, every family is very different um, and every kid is very different. And every time you think you get a rhythm, something's gonna shift it and change it. And it's just all about just trying to get through that week and just trying to succeed with the kids that week um, has been a huge game changer for us. Instead of trying to find the pinnacle thing to do, 
Um, that is sort of my thing is I like to look for like what would be the holy grail of options. And it just doesn't exist in this situation. Um, our kids are living, growing beings. And so I should be treating the way that they approach a situation that same way as they're learning and growing. Um, so that has been really helpful to us. With that being said, don't let other families pressure or convict you as to how you should approach this. Everybody in our church is extremely supportive. Um, our, our full church is supportive of the idea of not having a children's church. So from our pastors to our elders, to our deacons, to our congregate members, to even our guests, everybody understands that the goal is to have our children involved. And so we're all like this really big team about it. But we also have other families that are raising kids there as well that are doing it differently than us. And it is so important to not let their convictions on how they're handling their kids affect the way that you're approaching your children. Um, I have struggled with this greatly with even the ones in our church that aren't making me feel convicted a certain way. I've also felt this way about podcasts I've listened to and pastors that I've listened to outside of our own, obviously, things like that that have, I've learned that we have to figure out what our convictions are as a family, where we want to go with it and what our goals are and try to work there forward. Another thing I wanted to share is what really helped us was also compartmentalizing our church service, sectioning it out so that there was almost stages, I guess, for our kids to work through throughout the service so that they weren't doing one thing for a huge block of time. So having them participate during one part of it and then sit and functionally draw for a certain part of it and then so on and so forth worked really well for us. Uh, another fun tip was my mother-in-law, if you have family that want to be part of this and help in some way that you go to church with, um, my mother-in-law sits with us in our row and so she will bring treats for the kids each week that they just don't normally have. And when I say treats, I'm talking about like organic gummies or something like that, that the kids get to look forward to. Um, once the sermon is finished and we go up for communion, when we come back, um, she will give them the snacks to have during the last couple songs. And it just kind of helps tide them over, get them past the hump. Another thing that has been helpful to us is the stretching of the legs. Um, this was advice that we received from some graduated parents is, uh, don't be afraid to let your kids stretch their legs, take a break during service, uh, walk into the other room, have them walk. They used to talk about having them run a lap around the exterior of the church. We just will walk into the other room, um, maybe go, get a cup of water or steal a couple croutons from the salad table or something like that and give them a second to take a breather and then amp them up to get back in there and sit down and help them kind of be excited about going back in there. We also will stretch the legs by, uh, you know, with our littles, just standing up, going to the back of the room and kind of doing a little bop and sway and, and just helping them get a different perspective and just allowing them to kind of get fresh eyes on the situation <laughs> always has been super helpful. And then the last piece of advice that I want to throw out there is there are going to be rough days and there's going to be easy days and the rough days will pass and then another Sunday will come and new graces will be there and you'll be able to move forward. So that has been really helpful for us when we walk away from a really rough day. Um, just remembering that we achieve the goal of being there. We achieve the goal of having our kids being part of service. Just remembering that our kids have bad moments just like we all do. So keeping that in mind helps keep you in a place of grace as well as them. Thank you guys for joining me today and I hope you have a wonderful day.